Today I would like to uh, show you what actually happens as far as alcohol analysis is concerned. Many of us uh, know this subject extremely well. Um, so basically alcohol is one of the most, the best studied substance, uh, well, to speak of. So today I would like to do two things. I would like to kind of show you uh, information, uh, initial information about alcohol, uh, what it is and how, you know, what is being done. And in this context, I would like to show you some uh, research in uh, biomarkers for alcohol use because this is one of the subjects which actually USDTL um, specializes in. So basically alcohol, it's, uh, it's a hydroxyethane, but uh, this is what we were drinking yesterday. And the molecular weight is a small molecule substance. Um, and the molecular weight, as you know, is about 46. So uh, NIAAA uh, gives annually some facts about alcohol. And I don't know if 2015 data are available, but in 2014, uh, 80, almost 90% of adult people drank, uh, drank alcohol at some point in their lifetime. About over 16 million people age 18 plus in the US can be belong to the category of people having an alcohol use disorder, AUD. About 1.5 million adults and 55,000 uh, adolescents receive treatment for that particular disorder. Uh, more than 88,000 alcohol-related deaths occur in the United States annually. And for example, during the Vietnam War, 57,000 soldiers were killed, so this is actually a stunning number. And this is a third leading preventable cause of death. And about 10,000, plus minus 2,000 every year, uh, were alcohol impaired traffic deaths. So people, it's a very impairing substance, as we know, and people actually drink and drive. And this is what causes enormous tragedies. Unfortunately, they kill other people. They don't that frequently kill themselves. Now, what happens with alcohol and pregnancy, because this is what our laboratory is also involved in, in, in this subject. Uh, approximately 30% women report alcohol drinking during the pregnancy, um, and 8.3% uh, reported binge drinking. After the first month of pregnancy, 22, over 22% 22 of women reported alcohol drinking. 2.7% of women were drinking during all trimesters of pregnancy and 7.9% during the third trimester. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, FAS, it's a very, very serious um, syndrome. Prevalence in the United States is estimated to be two to seven cases per 1,000 births. And fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, uh, which is kind of a less severe, but contains some elements, uh, which FAS is kind of uh, covers overall, is 20 to 40 cases per 1,000 uh, births. More than 10% of US children live with a parent with alcohol problems, which is also a stunning number. And approximately 250 billion, it's an annual cost, uh, it's an annual economic cost, uh, alcohol abuse related. So um, as we know, uh, there are certain ratios which are being used uh, in legal proceedings, but those are kind of effects. Uh, urine to whole blood alcohol ratio is about one to three. Uh, uh, 1.3 to 1, which means there is m more alcohol in urine than in blood. Uh, blood breath, it's about 2,000 to 2,300 to 1, which means the concentration of alcohol in exhaled <coughs> air is about 2,000 uh, less than in blood, but uh, uh, it can be correlated very easily because of that with, uh, uh, with the blood alcohol level and serum to whole blood is about 1.18, but there is kind of a wide range. As far as elimination of alcohol, uh, this actually comes 
from the chapter uh, written by uh, Alan Wayne Jones, who is a world-known specialist in the area of alcohol, and he calls this elimination pattern a hockey stick, which actually it kind of looks like. So from when the alcohol starts to be eliminated up to about 20 milligrams per deciliter, there is a zero order kinetics. Elimination goes uh, as a zero order kinetics, which means the same amount of drug, in this case alcohol, is eliminated uh, per unit of time. And this is actually great because we can do all sorts of calculations which I don't want to get into at the present moment. So we can estimate concentrations around the, the actual accident or, or actual nefarious event, which we are trying to establish what the concentration was at, at that point. And at around 20, uh, it becomes first order kinetics. The enzymes are, are not saturated anymore, so the elimination looks slightly, slightly differently. This is uh, alcohol metabolism, and uh, as we all know, around 95% of the alcohol metabolism takes this particular route, um, and there is uh, oxidation, non-P450 related and also P450 related. About 5% of alcohol is exhaled, uh, is present in the exhaled air, which is actually great because this allowed um, two scientists, Bork and Stein and uh, Rolla Harger, to develop um, um, uh, the instrument breathalyzer to measure actually concentration of alcohol in breath and correlated with the uh, concentration in blood. And also some, some part of the metabolism uh, is actually a uh, very small percentage goes towards ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate and also non-oxidative processes which uh, lead to fatty, ac uh, fatty acid ethyl esters and phosphatidyl ethanol, which I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> so, uh, as you all know, alcohol metabolism comprises of two enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase and aldeh uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase. Uh, in this case, alcohol is metabolized to acetaldehyde, which immediately gets metabolized to acetic acid. Um, the enzyme is called alcohol dehydrogenase, not ethanol dehydrogenase. That means it can chew on any other alcohol, and if we have a methanol on board, and uh, methanol poisonings are quite frequent, I remember from the history of my life uh, in mid-80s, I was actually working uh, part-time in the uh, clinical toxicology laboratory, which was part of the poison treatment center, and uh, frequently we had poisonings with methanol because it tastes the same, tastes the same, and mainly uh, at one point we had about 20 people poisoned, and they came from the, from the pharmaceutical um, company, which was actually manufacturing some drugs, and they were using methanol, and people basically started drinking it. Mm -hmm. And if this happens, then methanol is actually metabolized to what? formaldehyde, and formaldehyde is metabolized further to formic acid. As we all know, uh, formaldehyde basically um, and formic acid, they are very toxic and they actually uh, damage the um, optic nerve and this is why people, if they survive the poisoning, they are blind or their vision is very much impaired. So uh, there, there is 4-methylpyrazole, which can be used to block this particular enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase, and the question is why would anybody do that? Well, this happens when we have a poisoning, clinical poisoning with methanol, then this particular drug is given and alcohol is not metabolized to acetaldehyde because this enzyme is blocked, and so et uh, methanol can be uh, eliminated unchanged. Uh, this, uh, I don't know if this is still being used, but before 4-methylpyrazole, ethanol was actually given to people poisoned with methanol because, um, because alcohol dehydrogenase has better affinity to uh, ethanol than to methanol. So, um, so um, et ethanol was metabolized and methanol was eliminated unchanged. 
the second possibility, the second enzyme can be also blocked, and it could be blocked by drugs like the sulfiram, and basically that means the acetaldehyde accumulates in blood and it's not being eliminated, and this is used in the treatment of alcoholism. So people experience such a tremendous uh, effects of uh, toxic uh, acetaldehyde, basically vomiting and other, that they rather prefer not to drink alcohol than actually experience those uh, symptoms. So um, this is a very well known equation which uh, kind of connects uh, dose of the drug, in this case ethanol, uh, body weight and uh, drug concentration, in this case alcohol, and distribution factor, which is volume of distribution, which is called rho, and this is actually for men, for alcohol 0 0.7 liters per kilogram, and for women 0 0.6 uh, liter per kilogram. Alcohol is uh, very, has a high affinity to water, which means it's going to be accumulating in central compartment, which is blood, and it doesn't go, uh, it's not a good candidate for post-mortem redistribution, so the volume of distribution is below one because it just sits in tissues rich in water. So some other facts, this is rate of metabolism of alcohol, it is about 0 0.1 gram per kilogram per hour, so in other words if we have an individual like me uh, who weighs about 80 kilograms, uh, that means 8 grams of pure alcohol I will metabolize on a good day uh, per hour. So this is very easy then to estimate the amount of time which I need after, uh, after drinking to actually uh, drive or do some other work which requires uh, full attention. Disappearance from blood is about uh, 15 milligrams per deciliter per hour. Um, actually, uh, this graph presents uh, uh, elimination of the same dose uh, from blood, breath, saliva, and urine, and this is uh, breath alcohol concentration and uh, uh, breath blood ratio and existing uh, blood, blood alcohol concentration. This is also, uh, you all most likely know this particular table. It was prepared by Kurt Dubowski. Um, several years ago, and it actually correlates the concentration of alcohol in blood with a um, uh, state of uh, alcohol intoxication. Uh, Kurt Dubowski is still alive. Mm -hmm. I actually met him a couple of months ago during American Academy meeting, and he's doing very well. He's well over 90 now. This is another fact uh, important for the alcohol. It's so-called Mellenby effect. And this is actually acute tolerance, tolerance of alcohol. This is what it illustrates. That basically means that when the person starts drinking and the concentration of alcohol goes up, uh, there are all sorts of changes, behavioral changes. But then after the alcohol uh, maximum concentration is reached, uh, th there is uh, a tolerance to the alcohol. So the person actually thinks he or she is not drunk anymore and she may uh, sit down and start driving while being on that part of the elimination, on being during the elimination phase, and the concentration can still be over legal limit. Uh, this, these are concentrations of ethanol in alcoholic beverages, um, and uh, this is basically uh, grams of ethanol in one drink, and this is typical volume of one drink, and these are different uh, alcohol beverages. NIAAA also gives some important definitions like moderate alcohol consumption, uh, binge drinking, uh, heavy drinking, and you have all these definitions uh, listed here. I would, think, I would think I disagree with some of these levels, uh, some of frequency of drinking and the amount of alcohol but this, is, this comes from, from the Institute. Now, as far as, uh, so this was an introduction. Uh, now, as far as alcohol biomarkers, 
we have two types. We have direct markers and indirect markers. As far as direct markers, we can talk about actual or short-term consumption and chronic or long-term consumption. And with this, we have alcohol itself in blood, in urine, and this is what I was talking about. We have ethyl glucuronide in urine or blood. We have fatty acid ethyl esters in serum and in other specimens, <coughs> PETH, phosphatidyl ethanol in blood, uh, like in blood spots, coke ethylene. We have also some others, which I will not be talking about, so let's remove those. And uh, we have uh, long-term consumption. This is fatty acid ethyl ester in hair and meconium, ethyl glucuronide in hair, ethylene in hair and beta carbolines which also we will not be talking about today and indirect markers such as gamma glutamyl transferase or car uh, carbohydrate deficient transferrin but this is not the subject of uh, my talk today so this is basically what I'm gonna be focusing on and instead of talking about all these I'm gonna give you some uh, some results which we got and some work which we do uh, in, in the area of PETH, and this is the chemical structure of, of one of them. So, as far as ethyl glucuronide, one of the, of the best studied um, alcohol biomarker in blood and urine, uh, this, uh, this data, these statements come from the paper published by Wurst in 2015, last year, in alcoholism clinical and experimental research and I would strongly recommend this article to all of you who are interested in the subject matter because it gives a broad broad review of uh, biomarkers and their use. So as far as ethyl glucuronide in urine is concerned uh, these are the levels which according to authors um, correspond to unintentional use or recent use. This is the uh, this is the range for unintentional, unlikely, so somebody was actually using alcohol, but possible active intake uh, is probable. And ethyl sulfate, uh, which is slightly less significant, um, but the total abstinence is believed to be when the concentration is below 50 nanograms per mil, according to Wurst. Uh, this is how the appearance of uh, alcohol of alcohol and uh, ethyl glucuronide looks like uh, in blood uh, and this is ethyl glucuronide and this is uh, actually alcohol concentration and ethyl glucuronide uh, can be detected in urine 80 hours after heavy drinking but certainly uh, two to three days uh, after drinking which makes it much better indicator than uh, alcohol itself, which disappears from urine fairly quickly. It's eliminated. Uh, this is ethyl glucuronide uh, as a biomarker in hair versus nails, uh, fingernails and toenails, in this case fingernails. And this actually comes from the paper uh, published uh, by uh, Joe Jones, who is sitting in the first row here uh, in, two, in 2012. Uh, and by uh, his group at uh, USDTL. And actually in hair, uh, the uh, concentration of ethyl glucuronide was between limit of detection and 180 picograms, and in nails, this concentration was significantly higher, and these were matched pairs. Uh, and this is basically a male hair ethyl glucuronide and male nail ethyl glucuronide, this is a correlation, and hair uh, concentrations in male population and female, and in fingernails, as you can see, the concentrations are signif significantly higher in matched pairs. Now, uh, this comes from another paper coming from our laboratory um, from 2015, uh, we published a paper on our experience with detection of uh, many, many drugs in uh, nails, in fingernails and toenails, and this small table actually shows ethyl glucuronide and the concentrations in fingernails and toenails, and as you can see, uh, concentrations in fingernails are significantly higher than the same ones, uh, the same uh, concentrations in, in toenails. 
Now, uh, this is a very interesting table because it shows ranges of heterogluconide in human body fluids and tissues uh, after alcohol consumption. And um, what I would like to bring to your attention is actually hair. Uh, and those are, those are cases in which these concentrations were seen. So as you can see in urine, these concentrations are huge. Uh, the same actually in serum, in hair of uh, alcohol abusers, the concentrations are uh, start at about 25 picograms. This is kind of a cut off for uh, heavy uh, alcohol use and they go really to thousands of uh, picograms uh, per milligram. Uh, this is uh, ethyl glucuronide in hair. In people totally naive, the concentration is going to be below 8 picograms per milligram. And we have to remember alcohol is being produced in our body physiologically. So we have some alcohol. This is why we have enzymatic system, which, which takes care of alcohol. Now, with so social drinkers, like all of us yesterday evening, uh, the concentrations are going to be somewhere between 8 and 25. Uh, and these are actually Society of Herb Testing recommendations. Um, and they actually say that this threshold here is 30 picograms per milligram. And now chronic alcohol abuse always results in concentrations of ethyl glucuronide higher than 25 or, according to Society of Herb Testing, 30 picograms per milligram. Now, um, based on our work, actually, uh, Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin, was first to test uh, repeated drunk and drivers with alcohol biomarkers. And uh, this is being done in nails and actually in dry blood spots. And this was published in a couple of, uh, couple of uh, gazettes. Now, there is a problem with fatty acid ethyl esters um, because it is very difficult to opine about excessive alcohol consumption based on concentration of fatty acid ethyl esters. And in post-mortem post situation, situations, it is also sort of difficult, not to mention the fact that fatty acid ethyl esters are they spontaneously are being formed uh, with the presence of alcohol. This is very important um, in evaluating in utero exposure to drugs of abuse because there might be some situations in which um, meconium uh, or other specimens can be contaminated with alcohol, with wipes and stuff like this, and then we can get false positive results. And this was reported quite some time ago. Now, let's move to another biomarker. Uh, this is the simplest um, metabolism of cocaine I've ever encountered. So as we all know, cocaine is a tropane alkaloid, and it's a double ester. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the other, uh, another metabolites, but for many, many years, People didn't understand why people abusing cocaine drink heavily. They heavily drink alcohol. And this was revealed in early 90s, where cocaethylene was actually discovered. And the co uh, cocaethylene is a product of transesterification of cocaine. And it is typical, and it's always seen in specimens collected from people who actually abuse, abuse alcohol. So this is sort of double marker. It shows cocaine abuse and it also shows um, alcohol abuse. Now let's move to phosphatidyl ethanol and this is a group of phospholipids um, with a common phosphoethanol head group uh, onto which two fatty acid chains are attached and those could be different fatty acid chains. Uh, so PETH can form in red blood cells as a component of the cellular membrane, and it's a direct uh, alcohol biomarker, meaning that ethanol is incorporated into the final product. Um, so this is how it happens. 
And when uh, ethanol is not present, then phosphatidylcholine in the presence of phospholipase D uh, and water uh, becomes uh, the phosphatidic acid and choline are the final products of this reaction. Now, if we have alcohol on board in blood, then this uh, with the same enzyme and the same precursor, uh, that the result of that is actually phosphatidyl ethanol. This is another way of showing this, and basically advantages of phosphatidyl ethanol uh, are the following. It's 100% specific for ethanol, and PETH can only be formed in the presence of ethanol. So there is no, uh, no possibility of uh, PETH being formed without the presence of alcohol. Uh, it identifies heavy, heavy drinking uh, according to NIAAA, five or, or more drinks in one sitting for up to the last 30 days prior to measurement. PETH levels are not affected by race, gender, uh, BMI, or disease state. Dried blood spot specimens for PETH analysis are easy to collect and non-invasive. And this is also very important in, in this line of work. So basically, detection of PETH in dried blood spots uh, has certain advantages or elements which have to be met. Uh, this paper is, I believe, soaked with uh, um, guadininum thiocyanide, which actually is used to cause uh, lysis of cells. Uh, and these dry blood spots can be stored for quite some time. Well, I have no idea who John Doe is, uh, but this is what happens. Uh, we collect very small amount of blood, we spot it, and then it's uh, being sealed and, and shipped. So it cannot be easier than that. Then uh, there are punches which are taken from those spots, and they are soaked in methanol uh, containing a um, at a deuterated internal standard, and then they are being analyzed. So basically, this is the species which we are after. It's 16 carbon uh, palmitinic acid and 18 with one double bond uh, species, and this is about 37 to 46 percent of total PETH. And now again, uh, there is no really clear direction here because in the paper published by Wurst, as far as single consumption of alcohol, we have different levels mentioned by different authors and this goes from 20 nanograms to 120. Like repeated drinking, it's about 240 mm -hmm. nanograms per mil and excessive drinking, 500 nanograms. Some authors published 800 or slightly over 200. So these values look like a little bit uh, too high uh, from, from our experience. Uh, this is actually another paper published by Joe Jones and his group in 2011, and it actually shows a correlation, and this is the analyte, uh, PETH, shows a correlation, correlation between uh, concentration in dry blood spots and blood. And this correlation is actually very good. Is the correlation coefficient is like over uh, 0 0.9. Uh, and the concentrations are basically within, on, on average, two standard deviations. Now, this is a new technology which actually uh, SciEx uh, came up with some time ago. Uh, what happens in our laboratory, we actually analyzed we actually analyzed PETH in dry blood spots, um, uh, and currently the positive cutoff is 20 nanograms per mil, but the new technology, Selex ion technology by SciEx, allowed us to lower the concentration significantly, and this is actually a picture of one nanogram on column, and this is uh, internal standard, D31. PETH, and this is actually three nanograms, which produces very interesting uh, and clear picture. 
Now, as far as United States drug testing labs, these are the cutoffs which we are using for PETH in blood spots. At the present moment, the cutoff is 20 nanograms per mil. Ethyl glucuronide in urine, 100 nanograms. Remember, these concentrations can go to thousands of nanograms per mil. In hair, 20 picograms, and in umbilical cord, 5 nanograms per gram. Ethyl sulfate, actually 25 nanograms in urine. Now, um, we started a work on replacing uh, fatty acid ethyl esters with ethyl glucuronide, but all of a sudden we encountered another problem, which actually we published in the most recent issue of Tox Talk, which is uh, published on uh, Society of Forensic Toxicologists website, and the new issue was just issued a couple of days ago, so you guys, it's, it's a free access, everybody can go and, and see it. We actually noticed that the same situation with uh, ethyl glucuronide as we got with fatty acid ethyl esters, ethyl glucuronide is spontaneously produced in meconium when meconium is exposed to ethanol. We haven't studied the mechanism of this, but we used negative meconium samples and we, we, we got hundreds of nanograms of ethyl glucuronide in meconium without any enzymatic activity, without any maneuvering, just by incubation of small amount of alcohol and negative meconium, negative for ethyl glucuronide. And we sampled after 24 hours and 48 hours. So this is kind of another, another um, finding um, from just the last few weeks. <laughs> so in conclusion, basically, uh, this is what we can say about drugs, but let's, I, I'm going to stay focused on alcohol. So basically, in urine, oral fluid and whole blood uh, are the options, and they show very recent alcohol use. Um, and uh, in urine, we can use biomarker such as ethyl glucuronide et and ethyl sulfate, and then we can extend the detection time a uh, little bit. In dry blood spots, when we test for PETH, a direct <coughs> alcohol biomarker, uh, and we can, and it's actually very suitable for heavy, for detecting of, of heavy use of alcohol in the last two to three weeks. Now in hair, uh, hair is the most suitable uh, for testing of heavy use of alcohol or substances of abuse in the past three months. So that gives us pretty wide uh, time frame. And finally, in fingernails, uh, detection also can be up to three months, and uh, the analyte we are after at the present moment uh, is ethyl glucuronide. So when we talk about testing, uh, we tend at USTTL to present it as 333. And this would be three days, and it's in urine, and the target analyte is ethyl glucuronide, ethyl sulfate, three weeks in blood, and this would be PETH, <coughs> and three months, and the target analyte is ethyl glucuronide, and this is uh, nails and hair. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>